time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies and even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korean stories? From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. On Check It Out with Paul. It's a Wednesday and that means Paul Matthews joins us in the studio, graces us with his presence, I'd like to stay. <laughs> Looking lovely as usual, Paul. Are you doing well since we saw you last Wednesday? I'm doing very well, but you know, when it comes to June and mm. the weather hots up, I'm just, I'm, I've turned into a sweaty, saggy mess already. Yeah, I don't know what it is about being sweaty, because I'm sure humans have been sweaty for, you know, many days. Tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years where we lived. We came out of like the savanna areas and stuff. Oh, right? yes, I did. I'm sure we must have been quite sweaty quite often. But as a modern human being, there's nothing that gets me more agitated than being a sweaty mess for me. Like, it, I can't embrace it. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's fine. At the start of the day, you wake up, you're feeling good, you yeah. have a shower, you've put yes. on your clean clothes, uh-huh. and you're at home and maybe the air conditioning is on and it's okay, and then you step outdoors and suddenly... <laughs> Flump. <laughs> Whoosh. And, you know, in, in our house, we have one big air conditioning unit, and that's it. And then the three bedrooms, the kitchen area doesn't have air conditioning. And we don't often turn it on as well. It's kind of a last resort for okay. us. And so in the mornings when I'm getting ready, it's quite noisy because it's a very old unit. So I don't turn it on while I'm getting ready. I see. And on the days when it is going to be a scorcher, it's pretty warm from like 7 a.m. even in the apartment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm walking around in just my underwear, I will admit, until the point I have to leave the front door. Like I put my clothes just in front of the door and I just put them on really as quickly as I can to get out the house because the elevator has a bit of air conditioning so I really push the button several times get in there and I'm like if I can just make it to the car I'll be all right. (laughs) I have a different problem. We have the windows open and the fan on. So I'm dressed and I'm feeling cool. The problem is before I leave the house, I have to close the windows. Uh -uh. And as you close window by window, the circulation gets cut (laughs) off. And by the time I've closed the final window, it's so dense and humid and hot and I start to sweat and I have to run for the front door. Yes, Try to make it out. Right. There needs to be some kind of invention, guys and girls listening. I tried. In Korea, we do have a few things that have been invented. Did you ever try the ice vest? The ice vest? Yes. So I was filming for a TV show a while back. Are you sure this wasn't a joke they played on you? Well, I hope not. It didn't actually work, so maybe it was. And uh, I kept sweating a lot because it was summertime. And they were like, why don't you try the ice vest, you know, on our next filming? So I searched online... Or autumn jockey, it's okay. called. In like an Korean. ice waistcoat. Yes, it really was a waistcoat. You're right. It's more than a vest. Uh, although I think Americans call it a vest, right? Uh, yes. Not a waistcoat. Okay. But the uh, the thing that arrived was, I don't know, it looked like some kind of saucy underwear. Ooh. But it was this black waistcoat, very tight with a zip in the front, and then a kind of harness slash strap system so you could tighten it to your body. And it's meant to then sit really tight on you. And then just like you get with the food deliveries, you get a load of ice packs. And then you put them in the freezer. And then when you're ready to go out with your ice vest or or waistcoat on, you slip them into these pockets. And then you're walking around with ice on your body, basically. I like the sound of this. But it gets very wet, right, with condensation. Oh. Oh, dear. So you might not be sweating, but you're just dripping with, like, condensation instead. And your clothing, your top gets all wet and soaking. I don't oh, think no. they thought it through very well. Oh, dear. All right. Well, we'll uh, hope it's September before we know it, Paul, in the blink of an eye. Have It'll be nice fine. It'll be fine. We'll make it through the summer. Somehow, some way. Uh, today's book, then, that we're going to take a look at, is it suitable for children? Uh, no. And, <laughs> and quite frankly, the behaviour of uh, some of the characters in this story that is quite childish in oh, some ways. Okay. <laughs> it's a really interesting book. It's something a little lighter. It's something quick to read. It's a snack-sized short story from a brilliant collection by writer Park Kwan So. Um, and just to let you know, there are two different spellings out there for her name. Okay. Sometimes it's W-A-N hyphen S-O. Okay. And sometimes it's W-A-N 
hyphen S-U-H. Park Hwan So. Yeah, with the romanizations, I've seen it many times when we've been looking at authors. Uh, maybe not officially spelt different ways, but sometimes some websites will have it one way, other websites another. So go with the Hangul. That's why we should learn that, right? Park Hwan So. There's only one way to spell that. Exactly. And the story <laughs> we're looking at today is called Lonesome You. 너무도 쓸쓸한 당신, translated by Elizabeth Hagen Yoon. And um, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it's only 30 pages long or so. Oh, wow, nice and short. But she breathes so much life into her characters. We've got this, uh, this older woman and mm-hmm. a husband, and they're sort of dealing with jealousy and age and money and the in-laws, and mm. it's short and it's sharp, and it's great to sort of describe all the difficulties that older couples face as the years fly by and as romance sort of uh, goes off the boil. Oh, dear. How old are we talking? Like, not grandma, grandpa stage? Getting there, we're talking about retirement age. Oh, wow. And the in-laws are still an issue. Well, yeah, well, their the... son has just got married. Ah, I see. In that direction, I was thinking maybe parents-in-laws, but no, yeah. No, no, we're looking at another family. Oh, goodness <laughs> gracious. You know, My mother is Korean, and so she is an in-law to my wife. Yes. And uh, until I got married, I didn't really consider that whole in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. But in Korea, for the longest time, for for generations and generations, it's been an issue um, how they get on, right? Or don't get on, or the hierarchy. (laughs) Uh, But in this case, it's rather than the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law getting on, it's the mother-in-law and mother-in-law. Getting on or not getting on. I've been to weddings where you can sense the rivalry <laughs> between yeah. the two camps when they're like, a, they, they often do a candle lighting before the ceremony yes. and they both are trying to make their candle look better. They're dressed in their hanbok. Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, very different from the West in some cases, and some cases maybe similar. Uh, Park Won Sa, have we heard from her before? Uh, we have. We've done a, a short story of hers before, uh, a novella, um, and she is one of the best writers that Korea ever had. Oh. So I feel it's really good that we're featuring her again. She was born in k y u n g i d o province in 1931. Um, she started studying at Seoul National University, very prestigious, in mm. 1950. The problem was what happened in 1950? Oh. The start of the Korean War. I'm guessing education was put on hold. It was. Um, However, she made it through and she debuted as an author in 1970. Uh, She often writes from her own life. And in fact, her first novel was uh, autobiographical. It was called The Naked Tree. And it won the Yosong Donga New Novel Competition. And then over the years, uh, she produced many, many uh, short stories, 10 short story collections, 15 novels. Wow. And often dealing with families. often dealing with the rise of the middle class and how Korea was changing and how not just uh, the country was changing, but how social and moral standards were also changing. So she really captured... I don't know. I, I, I want to say she, she writes about men very well, but she really captured women's lives of the time mm-hmm. as, a, as a woman writer and able to really describe what was going on, how they were thinking. And I mean, we lost her in 2011. She passed away then. Mm-hmm. But her work is still vital. It's still important. And, and overall, It's still really, really good. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I guess that point of view to have... from a woman author, a a female author at that time would have been quite rare because someone of that gender, unfortunately, in 1950, there can't have been many female students at places like Seoul National University at the time. Uh, Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, Korea has changed so rapidly. And we've seen we've seen the change in terms of gender dynamics and Mm -hmm. uh, women becoming, you know, able to to study, able to work, you know, uh, in the last century. Um, And she really was one of the front runners. Mm. She was someone who was pushing Uh, pushing the boundaries when it came to Korean literature for women. Fantastic, yeah. To have her point of view in these novels and short stories, really important for Korea, I believe. Uh, the translator, Elizabeth h e j i n y u n Uh, my memory's a bit sketchy. Have we heard from her? Uh, we have not. This is uh, our first time featuring her, and this is actually her first full-length translation. Uh-huh. There's not a lot of information out there about her. Um, she was born in Korea. She immigrated to the US at the age of 11, went to Cornell University, and has worked for various non-profit organizations in the US, Korea, and Japan. And this translation, which was published in English in 2013, mm-hmm. the original coming out in 1998, is brilliant. It's 10 short stories in total. and they're all really, really good.
Ah, so there's 10 short stories. Are we just focusing in on one of those? Just the one. Okie dokie. Uh, so we're going to get to our first reading, Paul. Set the scene for us. Uh, well, we're looking at the husband mm-hmm. and the wife's opinion of the husband, how she <laughs> views him, perhaps. Fantastic. Let's take it away. However small the gathering, the stage symbolises power and authority. And as a person of power standing on the platform, he could not tolerate even one inattentive person. What he demanded from the audience was not mere attention, it was respect. He had been so committed to his responsibilities as an authority figure on stage. Who could stop him now from fulfilling his duties as an attentive audience member Off stage. The reason he was less authoritative with his family wasn't because he was a loving family man. There was no need for him to assert his authority because he assumed that it came naturally with being the man of the house, as long as he fulfilled his role as the breadwinner. For him, that meant living on as little as possible and handing over most of his paycheck to his family. His effort in this matter bordered on obsession. This was true during their years of separation, which he accepted without any question, as well as after his retirement. What was his life like these days, she wondered. She looked at the hand she had grabbed a moment earlier. Coarse and dirty under the nails. Like stepping on a foreign object and stumbling, she was startled by a new emotion stirring inside her that she hadn't felt when she had first grabbed his hand. I don't know, I'm a little conflicted. I guess the guy is a little conflicted as well. Having a small gathering, demanding some like attention from the audience, and then it starts to talk about him and his family life, which is kind of more stereotypical, I guess, handing over as much money as you can to your family. Then it gets a bit weird. Uh, they had years of separation. It doesn't talk about why or... How? No, uh-huh. they're a very interesting couple okay. and they're not exactly the happiest of couples. And uh-huh. uh, he's a teacher. And so when he's on the podium, he's a figure of authority. But at home, well, he's not much to his wife. No, although he he feels on that reading I saw, you know, that if he's paying or, or giving his, his income, then he deserves like some kind of uh, unspoken authority at home. But he's retired now. Uh Uh-oh. There's no income coming in. And what's this new emotion? I'm thinking the feeling that I got that she got from holding his hand was maybe a positive thing. But is it negative? Uh, No. We shall see. (laughs) I I will let you know. But I do love this story because you really get into the mind of this woman. Uh Uh-huh. Is it all from her perspective? It is. So it starts on a mid-year graduation day. Mm -hmm. And this main character, the wife of the story, is waiting in a cafe called Pavarotti. Uh And she's feeling a little bit odd. She's looking at the young waiters and having certain urges. Uh Um, And her daughter has arranged the meeting place for her and her husband. Because he's got a really bad habit of ending up in the wrong place, of missing appointments. Oh, dear. Uh, And she always gets anxious and embarrassed and angry at him. Okay. And it's important because this is their son... Chehun's graduation. All right, a big day for the family. Uh, and also, he's just got married. Wow. So it's a big day because he and his wife are going to go and study overseas and start a new life. Wow. So they're going to go and see him and celebrate with him, that, but they're also going to have to see the in laws. Who are coming to the graduation. Yes. Uh-huh. And that's not a necessarily a good thing. <laughs> and when a husband arrives, He makes a complete fool of himself. Oh He's embarrassing her by mispronouncing Pavarotti as Pastorotti. <laughs> and uh, he, he shouts to order coffees. He's not being polite. And, uh, well, we get, we get the impression that they're really not a couple anymore. They oh, are dear. separated. They've been separated since her daughter left for college. Oh, I see. They're and he, apart. he sends her a little money every month because he's retired now. She mm-hmm. lives in the city and he lives in a little house in the countryside near the DMZ. This Not. is full of uh, really, uh, what's it called, common, I feel, male and female roles here. I see so many 
Korean wives embarrassed by their husbands yeah. in certain occasions. Like, don't say that. My mum was one of them. My mother-in-law is just the same as my mother as well. Yeah, I, I often embarrass my wife. Uh, me too. <laughs> and then that, that need, I think we've talked about it not too long ago, for the countryside living for men. And then females want to be in the city. We've definitely talked about that on different corners on this show as well. Yeah, so we've got, we've got chalk and cheese. Mm-hmm. We've got two people who really don't match together and they're bicker, bickering, they're squabbling, and eventually they go to the graduation ceremony and they have to face the in-laws. And the in-laws are different to them. Okay. And also, well, they embarrass her because the, uh, the other mother-in-law mm-hmm. hands her an envelope with plane tickets and a hotel reservation slip and say, oh, we're paying for a trip to Cheju oh. for your son and our daughter, um, and sort of insinuating that, that they can't afford it. Oh, so they're going to pay for it. And, and she says, oh, you give it to them. They don't have to know who's paid for it. Oh, and we'll give goodness. them some spending money as well. And she forces the envelope into her handbag. So kind of seemingly nice on the surface, but depending on how it was done, maybe like a little slap in the face. Yes, if you have what we call in Korea, nunchi, uh-huh. which is like the, the awareness of what's going on, mm-hmm. you know that there's some <laughs> rivalry going on okay. here. Okay. Um, and the ceremony finishes. The son comes over to greet them, but she's a bit frosty. Like, he, he wants to put his mortarboard on her head to take a photo. Yeah. And she pushes him away. Oh, dear. And so dad steps in and does it and is very jovial. Mm-hmm. Um, but she can't take it anymore. And she drags her husband away. <laughs> Physically. Yeah, they leave. Uh, she lies to her husband about why they're going. They say, oh, we have to go now. Uh-huh. Um, and the husband's like, okay, well, uh, well, shall I take you to dinner? Mm. And she sort of says, okay, fine. Yeah. And uh, they go and eat barbecue. She's not really happy with that choice. Of course not. <laughs> but, but she's hungry, so she eats. And then they get in a taxi and she takes him to a love motel. Oh, and even the though fir- they're separated. Yeah, and it's the first time they've been in their long years of marriage. Oh, ever? Yeah. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and so um, he pays for both dinner and the room, and uh, she comments on that. Oh, let's find out how. Well, you must have more money than I thought, she said caustically, stopping at the stairway where it made a sharp turn. He had received the key, and she was following her up the stairs. She knew him to be an unrivaled cheapskate, but he had paid for dinner and the hotel without so much as a whimper. He never had a dime to spare, for reasons she knew only too well. At times, she may have been embarrassed by his frugal ways, but she never resented it. They were a couple with no feelings left for each other, not even suspicions of infidelity. Even for such couples, money supposedly remained a touchy subject and she was surprised and ashamed to discover that this might be true in her case as well. You know uh, that it was Chaeyoon's graduation today. I thought we might go out to eat with the in-laws, so I've been putting aside some money for the occasion. She didn't know how to react to his quiet and somewhat dejected explanation. The room was dim and cosy, not as racy as she had imagined. Outside the window, beautiful houses, either vacation homes or hotels probably, stood scattered on the hillside across from the Han River. The hotel building had a garden below with a well-manicured lawn that was so close to the river you could almost stand on its edge and soak your feet in the water. She stood for a long time looking out the window and listening to the water running in the shower. So she's seeing a, a side of her husband maybe she, she didn't expect, not being so frugal with the money. She just lost how to react to his explanation of saving up that money. Does this mean she's having like second thoughts? There's a bit of romance coming around the corner? It does seem a little bit that way. And then uh, he comes out of the shower in his underwear and she's really put off by the sight of him. <laughs> She, oh, no. she feels pure loathing for him. Oh, I um, feel a bit sorry for the guy, to be honest. So do I. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think that's the whole point. This is a dysfunctional relationship. Or, well, it's not even a relationship anymore. Yeah, they're separated. Yeah. But, but still n- married. Exactly. Okay. But now here comes the sneaky part. Okay. So uh, when she left 
the graduation ceremony, she knew what she was doing. Mm. She took the tickets with her. Oh, she didn't you, give them. Didn't give them back. And she puts into place the next part of her plan. She calls the in-laws and apologizes, says, oh, no, we left so suddenly because of my husband. He just had to go and I forgot to give them the plane tickets. Oh, whatever will they do? Blaming it all on her hubby. Yeah, but also spoiling the fun. Until the in-laws say, oh, don't worry, they can still get the reservations without the tickets. They don't need them. They've already gone. So she was just trying to be incredibly spiteful there. Yeah. Oh, dear. Okay. So so her plan to spoil this moment for happiness has completely and utterly failed. Mm. And uh, she gets very angry with her husband. Takes it out on him. Exactly. (laughs) Rushes out to get some air. And when she returns, her husband is asleep and she looks at him and she sort of, she starts to feel concern for him. Maybe... A sense of compassion. Oh, this is so topsy turvy with her emotions, is it not? It, it really is, but but it's so real. Mm. I I have met women like this. I have met men like this in Korea. Absolutely. Um, this is the magic of Park Won Sook. She manages to capture what it is to be in this unhappy relationship, and also how you can be toxic but loving at the same time. Yeah, I don't want to name any names, and I won't do, but I definitely know some women in my life like this. Uh, maybe not as far as to properly spite someone by like withholding tickets. I don't think many I know would go that that far. But this relationship as well with husbands, because in Korea for the longest time, not so much with the new generation, divorce was unthinkable. So even if you were incompatible, arguing and bickering all the time, You just stay together, you know. Exactly. And we're we're going to talk about more about that in part three. (laughs) Okie dokie. I'm in London. I'm in Australia. Tokyo. The Philippines. Finland. Indonesia. New York. Arirang Radio. Radio. Now live in Seoul. She gazed at the flowing river for a long time, long enough for her husband to have fallen asleep before returning to the room. It was cooler in the room than by the water, and her husband was snoring in his sleep in his worn-out underwear, with the blanket kicked off to the side. Before she could feel repulsed by his appearance, she felt concerned that he might catch a cold. She reached for the light, flower-print blanket, and while doing so, she couldn't help but see his legs up close. They were covered with mosquito bites, some swollen red at the peak of inflammation, and some healing down to brownish patches. There were so many. How could those tiny creatures be so cruel as to suck the blood from those scrawny legs? What was his life like that he'd allow himself to be mutilated like this? From the dirt under his nails, she could see the impoverished and exhausting life he had eked out. His monthly income was more than enough for him to live comfortably in retirement if he wished. A hot lump of compassion rose to her throat as she looked at her husband who so willingly shackled himself to his patriarchal responsibilities. She gently stroked the mosquito bites on his shin as one would caress a piece of antique furniture, beat up and grimy from years of wear. I don't think it's possible to not feel for him. And uh, she's finding that out as well, it seems, in this motel room, comparing him to an old piece of furniture. Yeah, she loves her husband like an old armchair. (laughs) Um, But also maybe she realises that she has been one of those mosquitoes sometimes. Ah, I yeah. see the symbolism there. Sucking the life out of him, and he's done it willingly. Yes. But uh, he's become this sort of, this shell. Um, yeah, the romance is gone, the passion is gone, the companionship is gone, but they're still together, even though they're separated. It is so real, this story, I feel, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, 
it's nice to get some realism there. It also feels like, oh, I don't know, that could be the way that certain married couples are heading in their lives. And... Absolutely. And uh, that's not to say that all Korean couples are like this. Of They're course. not. Yes. But there are some couples in every country mm. who end up in this sort of position. But it's interesting when we look at it in terms of Korean culture. Now, you've, you've been married a while now. How many sure. years? Ten years almost. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've been married since 2008. Mm-hmm. So it's... 13. Wow. Lucky, lucky for some. <laughs> um, but there's an interesting term here, and I n- have never used it with my wife. Uh-huh. And I wonder if you've used it or your wife has used it. Mm-hmm. And that's the term chipsaram. Chipsaram, literally like house person. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever used that? Be- uh, to my wife, no. I've no. heard it used many times, though. And I think the older generations, they maybe don't bat an eyelid. They just yeah. say it, you know. But when I first heard this term, and it is a cultural difference, and I'll say this now, I was quite shocked. Mm. Because in Korea, we have many loving terms. Like mm-hmm. we say, yobo is the term that you would use to affectionately call your husband and wife. Sure. Oh, yobo, are you okay? Oh, yobo, I love you. Mm-hmm. Um, but this term, jipsaram, house person, it's like it's the person who's at home. Yeah, in charge of the chores and things like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's no romance, there's no love. And for me, it feels almost like you're talking about an armchair. It does <laughs> sound very cold, that word, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think that can be an issue sometimes is that the heat goes out of the relationship and Mm. instead of a friendship, instead of a a partnership, it becomes like, well, you're my chipsaram, you're my house person, you're the person who lives with me even though I don't necessarily love you anymore. Yeah, and so that's the term often used to a kind of stay-at-home wife, right, from a hubby, uh, the mother of the household. and. Yeah, you're right. It it can sometimes become almost like a business arrangement between the two people. Yes. And you're right. I guess in the West, what you'd hope for is, yeah, obviously romance can kind of die out in many instances, but you hope to become good friends then for the journey. Exactly. And the thing is, we look at the rates of divorce in other countries compared to Korea. And now there are there are many couples who do get divorced in Korea. Mm -hmm. But until relatively recently, it was a bit of a taboo. Yes. You had to stick with your partner. There's the sense of duty like you've got to make sure your kids are raised properly you've got to make sure you can pay for their wedding or their honeymoon Mm -hmm. you've got to keep up appearances with the neighbors and you get trapped in your traditional duties so in this story we have the wife who's trapped as the homemaker and we've got the husband who's trapped as the breadwinner yeah those are the roles that you kind of felt you were tied to here in Korea and Yeah, traditionally, you just suck it up, right? That was kind of the mantra. It doesn't matter if you're feeling a bit down about it. It doesn't matter if you're not particularly happy with your lot. You're just going for that. And it was all about the kids, wasn't it? It was like, as long as I'm providing for the kids, and not necessarily the kids have to be happy, right? They could be like studying their butts off. Yeah. As long as you're providing the opportunities they need, then you kind of felt like, I'm doing my job. Exactly. And then you have another issue that this whole patriarchal responsibility is Mm. that traditionally speaking, men were the breadwinners and uh, men would often be working late most evenings. Sure. You'd be stuck at the office till 9, 10, 11, Mm -hmm. sometimes later. And so you hardly ever see your wife and children and you become estranged. So you're just the moneymaker. You're literally just the breadwinner rather than an active member of the family. And, And this is what we see in this story here. This father... Yes, he's he's a father and he loves his family, but he doesn't really have a family anymore because he's been so isolated. Sure, he's not really connected. And yeah, I've, I've seen that in many Korean families from like my generation. A lot of my friends around me said, I'm not really and never have been close to my father. I found it very difficult because he was never home for a start. And then... They didn't know how to act with their kids. Maybe just mucking around is okay, but like deep, meaningful conversations and stuff. Dream on kind of thing. Yeah, but but unfortunately, I think that that's all over the world. Men, we Mm -hmm. men have an issue with communication. (laughs) And so talking son to father especially can be really difficult. Yeah. But it's a really good reminder. I mean, this story, this story is so sharp and so interesting, but it does remind us that relationships are really hard mm. and we have to work at them. And that it requires so much energy to make them work. And it's, it's sad we get to the end of this story, but at the same time we think you've, you two, you've worked hard at this. You've yeah. not succeeded, but you've done your best. Yeah, and there's still, I guess, a glimmer of hope at the end of this story. She's showing compassion for him. She still cares for him 
despite being repulsed for a little while, she, I think, realizes all the sacrifices he's made, seeing those scrawny legs with yeah. all those mosquito bites. But again, it's a reminder of us when we see our partner looking a little bit old, a little <laughs> bit scrawny, it's a reminder that we're not a spring chicken either. Ah, uh, yeah, it can reflect back to you. Uh, and, and I guess now I feel a bit more compassion for her as well. Maybe she was stuck at home. Maybe she wasn't happy in that role. And it kind of all came to a head. Who do you have to take out? upon apart from your other half right exactly that there is no bad guy in this story just two unhappy people and as always thanks to you paul for lovely reading thank you thank you thanks as always to the literature translation institute of korea for their help with copyright permission for this broadcast thank you to park one sir for her wonderful story and to elizabeth hejin yun for her amazing translation okay we'll be back with another book next wednesday in the meantime have a wonderful week goodbye You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST.